Hey and welcome back to Mark and Chums. Yes, well we're here back at the Fox again and uh, this time I've got a very special guest who I've known for, we're working out 25, 30 odd years and she has been a choreographer, she's been a West End director, director of all sorts of tours throughout the UK and has had many clients like Bill Kenwright and all that over the years and also, which I didn't know about, invented or created now let me just put the glasses on. Todography. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a bit. Of course it is the wonderful, very talented, and my dear friend Carol Todd. Hello Carol. Hi Mark. Thanks for coming Thanks along with me. <laughs> chat already up there so I mean it's yeah. alright so we might have to go over over that again. That's alright. So yeah we, we, just thinking about that Karen we've been mates for oh, years. I well mean, it's before the Doctor Who years yeah. I'm sure. Yeah because you did the musical version. I did. Because that was at the Wimbledon Theatre and it went on to John Pertwee and jo oh, yeah, John Pertwee first then we had Col Colin Baker. Baker. And then we had... David Bank. No, I didn't have David. It was um, Sylvester McCoy. Oh, did you? I mean, I didn't know you. Yes. Yeah, 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 I had the, the three guys. It was a bit of nonsense. It was good nonsense. It was, it was awful. <laughs> it was, no, that's the word from Carol. She said it was awful. <laughs> well, I actually... but, but, you know, the good thing about it, it was awful because it looked like the BBC version. And everyone loves the BBC version version of Doctor Who because it was like, you know, walls that would be wavering about. Oh yeah, and it certainly was that. Yes. I saw it on its opening, well that opening week, which was at the Wimbledon. Yes, yeah that was Couldn't right. get a parking spot. Oh, we got it. And we fell about. I know. I know. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I'm not going to decry it because it was just a bit of fun, but well, I'll the, tell the you best, what. Go on, I was going to say the best bit was, yeah. was What's the name of the table that you have in Doctor Who? In the, there's a special name for that table. The console. Yes, and it's yeah. got a thing that goes up and down in the middle of it. Well, now you'd have an automated version. Well, the original one was automated. No, it, uh, the original one. Oh, but okay. our one, uh, you had the stage manager guy. He oh, had really? to crouch down, shuffle it on, and then he had to push it up and down. I mean, it was... It was not good. But I tell you who was in it. <laughs> but I tell you who was in it who's done very well. Rebecca Thornhill. Mm -hmm. And she played the but there was a boy and a girl. Yeah, I remember the boy and the girl, yeah. yeah. And she played the girl and she now has starred in all sorts of West End shows. I mean she's a proper West End. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful The West End theatrical. Yeah, so that was very nice. And I can't, what was the guy, musical guy? Steve Edis yeah. was the musical director. And we wrote two songs together, which they use in the show. Which is the only time I've written a show of a song officially. And I have it in my filing cabinet, sealed up, like with copyright on it. Uh, and I know one is ever going to want well, to geez, ever look at it. I remember the cabaret because it was a musical. This is well, it was, it was a play with two songs. Well, right, semi-musical. Yeah. But there was a cabaret singer who actually sang with her back to the audience because it, I remember... He was making the... It, and I'm thinking, Judy surely, singer. surely she's the, she's the dog. <laughs> no, being authentic. Really. Yeah, being authentic. Yeah. But that, that is one of... <clears throat> That's one of many things you've done because you know, I mean, you're on IMBD and all that. You've got you've got a few other things. You know, you've done a bit of dabbling yourself on the boards, haven't you? Oh yes. Well, I did six years in the West End, mm. and in those days, you would do the show would last for two years. People like Harold Fielding, yeah, and I can't remember the other people. There's Harold, I most oh tenants as well, HM yeah. tenants. And you would do two hour, uh, two hours, two years in a musical, and then it would finish, even if it was full audiences, and they put new stuff on. Whereas now they just let it stagnate and go on for decades. Twenty five years. Yeah. yeah. And we would do often one year, and then there'd be an audition for the next musical at mm. the Lane or in the Strand or whatever. So I did 
Promises, Promises, which I was very fortunate that was Michael Bennett who directed and choreographed it. And Michael Bennett is the guy who created Chorus Line. Ah. So we didn't see him in rehearsals. We got um, the assistant when yeah. we taught the show. And the young girl in it who sings, What Do You Get When You Fall In Love? Yeah. She, that was Betty Buckley. Mm -hmm. And that was her first visit to London. And also Julian McKenzie. It was her first debut in the West End. She was the Owl Lady. I remember Julian McKenzie and bumped into my late friend Nick Courtney, who was um, in, she did the second series called French Fields, which was a comedy oh, series by yeah. James, and she was playing that with Anton Rogers. Oh, yes. Yeah. And Nick Courtney played the Marquis. Right. As he called it. <laughs> As it's Marquis, isn't it, Nick? But he, yeah, he, played Do he was in Doctor Who. Brigadier in Doctor Who. Oh, right. So I remember meeting her, she was delightful. She was just glorious, really yeah. glorious. So that was Promises, Promises. And the fact that we did get to see Michael Bennett. Oh, and another thing which is quite interesting, I think, from looking back at how theatre used to be, is because there were American shows that were brought over, they used to like to have people who were the doubles of the original Broadway person. Mm -hmm. And when we did the line-up at the Prince of Wales Theatre, after we'd done all the recalls and everything, and we're all lined up, at about I think there were about 12 girls in it, possibly, and I'm at the end of the line, and then one girl who will be nameless, who'd been kicked out, came down and did that popping her head out of the wing and going, oh, oh, you're still auditioning. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to intrude. I just came to see if it was all finished. And they went, oh, hang on a minute. Mm -hmm. um, could you just come and join the line? And Carol, would you mind just going to the left? And this girl was put in the position that I'd won and I was made the swing instead of having a part of my own. But being the swing, being understudy, being dance captain is why my career went to what I do or what mm. I've done, let's say. But it was interesting that if you looked really like one of the Americans, you would be replaced. Yeah, be cast, yeah. So we, we did see Michael Bennett eventually, because he died so young. So I did that. Then I did Showboat at the Adelphi which had Cleo Lane in it mm. and <laughs> oh she was wonderful lovely one Bill she used to sing Bill with such heart and soul and we would go and stand in the wings every night and John Dankworth used to mm. come and pick her up and he was a lovely man as well mm. so that was oh and Lorna Dallas I mean lots of those kind of American names. Well, Johnny Dangworth wrote the first series, Thing Music, to The Avengers. Did he really? All about them. Didn't know and that. Oh, yes. Yeah. But it wasn't as good as the second one. I prefer right. the second one. Yeah. Which I used to have. The second one was my theme tune for when I was on the radio. Oh, all really? Those years ago. Right. But uh, yes, but I, 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 the amount of people, I mean, I'm just looking at this, everyone. Now look at this. I sat on the other glasses. <laughs> Not only did she come with one CV, you've got two CVs there. One is, one is for West End Theatres and London-based um, productions, and then regional theatres. And just, this is how prolific, this is regional theatres. On the back as well, yes. Mm -hmm. And then... I'm surprised, you know, got, you're out of the West End now. Look, I mean, look, this is the West End. Absolute, what a achievement. I have to keep those because I have to look at them very occasionally just to remind myself. Um, well, what an achievement. I mean, yeah, but the, the amount of um, stuff that has come out. So, I mean, everything from, you know, things like Girls' Night Out. Um, that was a good one. Uh, I'm just doing a 42nd Street Gala, Hello Dolly Gala, Elvis the Musical. Um, Dancing in the Streets, that's Dancing in the street. seven years we did in the West I quite like the idea of the naked boys singing, but that's another story. <laughs> well, 
That was hard. Uh, oh, I think it's hard. <laughs> we don't care. Uh, we don't care. It was <laughs> yeah. interesting. I did yeah. another one that was had a lot of nudity in it. It was a straight play by Peter Turson oh. called Strippers, which I did up in Oldham. That was a hard rehearsal because it turned out because it needed full frontal nudity from the women and the women that did the, the full frontal bits when you sat down and did like you do mm. talking with the actors in part of the procedure of rehearsals it turned out that those ones had issues and they had wanted to be in the play to get over their own issues in their own life it made it very oh. difficult and then I can remember one thing that happened that when, I, when we did the, the stripping for the first time for them, I took them to the pub at supper break. Then I brought them back. I had red flood lights put around the rehearsal room so that it's just red. And I had music, disco music and that. So I said, okay, we're all going to dance around in a circle, which we did. And as they started to dance, we'd take bits of clothing off. Mm. He said, I'll strip too. So I stripped with them. Mm. So once we were all naked, we were all going, oh, 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 oh don't look Sounds like naked. one of your films. <laughs> mm. um, so that was, that was good. But then I, another time in the evening... Are you willing to do anything that your cast is going to do, even to that extent? Well, that you had, you had I was younger then. You know, yeah. I wouldn't do it now. With all my ailments and all my ailments, because you've got arthritis and stuff mm. like that, you think it could get you down? But I thought, well, the black side, you just got to get on with well, it. Well, that's the thing. Where do you draw the line between what is real life that everyone has to go through at some point yeah. and what is pushing it? Yeah. You know, and, and turning it into something else. We're lucky because we come from an era mm. where you did just go, oh no, okay. Mm. Put yourself oh, together, on we go. And also we had opportunities, because I know in the 80s when I did all the trade shows and conferences and I was queen of conferences, mm. and we earned money. Mm. You know, we did really well. Mm. You know, and you're at an age where you're buzzing to get on and do things. Mm. So I think we've really had the best of it and we should be very grateful. I, I think so, because what I'm always liable to quote Warhol so everyone's going to be famous for 15 minutes. Not these days, they want to be famous for much longer than that because everyone's got a phone, they can do their mm -hmm. bit like this show, you know, it's, it's it's not an ego trip, it's just because they want to put some history stuff down mm -hmm. about the theatre. Uh, and it's not just all, all the guests that Mark and Chums is, are theatricals. The majority are, but there's what other ones that aren't, you mm -hmm. know, or there might be technicians in television or film. Yeah. You know, but it's something that... Um, Putting a bit of history down that other people may be interested in. But I think it's also interesting. Because it's lost now, that, as you say, it's lost. Yes, it's lost. And we, we hopefully have fun things to tell or interesting things to tell as a historical background to it all because um, things were much shorter then. When, and we do our job and we let it go and we move on to something else. Mm. Mm. So we've got lots of pockets of stuff. Like I said, the only thing I haven't done is radio or circus. I was, ice skater. Yes, I did Robin Cousins. Oh yeah, because he had, yes, the, uh, he had I, the office next door to mine. Yeah. In speed, well, I directed uh, eight years of Panto at Birmingham Hippodrome mm. when the Hippodrome was the biggest Panto before the Palladium took over as such. Yeah. And I had all the stars. I didn't have to direct it. You just had to put them in the right order because they were all so good. They did it themselves. Yeah. Brian Connolly's, Matthew Kelly's, everybody, Leslie Joseph, Sue Pollard, I mean the lot. Yeah. And um, we even... The lottery, I don't know how many years, it would have been in the 80s. Yeah, the lottery was about 84. Yeah, because we did Dick Whittington, and Leslie was probably the mermaid or something. And it was the second week of the lottery, so they 
brought them all up and we got to first scene on the go and then we stopped the show and then they came on and got Leslie to draw whatever it was for that Well, week. It, it, the first week was at Luton Airport oh, in, was the, it? in the Britannia Airways where I used to work for okay. their cabin crew there. Right. But in a moment, we'll come back to your own. Yeah. See you in a minute. And we're back. Well, Carol, uh, I've just been thumbing through your CV again, and I want to talk now about. I've got to put these on. Tales of Todography. Todography. Now, please, lectures with PowerPoint support include a history of pantomime, history of summer shows, and other theatre and related subjects. This is what this program's all about. So, what's Todography? Tardography is, because I do a lot of work with actors, mm. I mean, I, I used to do choreography with dancers, I had dance groups and all of that, mm. but I don't do that anymore. I do what we call musical staging, really, and I love to do that because it's, it's acting through dance, that they call There's a terrible phrase called acting through song that they teach now in um, colleges. And mm. And there shouldn't be the need for the word. I mean, if you sing a song, you're acting it. So mm, it shouldn't exactly. be because we're going to learn how to act through song. But anyway, that's another point of view. So this, working with all the actors or musicians, because I've done a lot of actor muso shows like Dreamboats and Petticoats and Tommy and mm. all that stuff. So it is giving them a word or definition phrase. So if we're doing... Say we're doing a 20s number and you're doing Scooby-Doo to that way and mm. Scooby-Doo to that way, that's called cleaning the windows. Mm. You clean the windows there, you clean the windows there. Mm. Or if you're doing um, Dark Sea Street Motown stuff and you're doing that, doom, da, da, mm. that's picking an apple off the tree, twist and pull, twist and pull. So they get, twist and pull. <laughs> they get so taken up with what the phrase is, oh, we're going to do cleaning windows, or we're going to do twists and pull. They forget that their body is actually doing it. They're not going, I can't dance, I can't dance. Or what, do I step away, what do I do? Yeah. They, they are, their heads are full of these little phrases. So that's toddography. Oh. And then what I do, the panto in the summer season and the ordinary one myself, I'm not an IT person at all, but I've managed to get my head round PowerPoint in a rough sort of way, and I've got a little projector, and I put together, it can be half an hour or 45 minutes or an uh, hour, presentation. whatever, presentation, and I do all the history of Panto and the history of summer season, and then I do little bits of personal stuff, like things that happen with Frank Bruno in Goldilocks, or things that happen with Eartha Kitt and something. And yeah, take those shows out. I did one, um, have you heard, oh, what's his surname? Professor Branwell Catalyst Club. It's very highly thought of in Brighton and East I'm not, I'm he's, Yeah, He's a very much a raconteur, he's a oh. professor or something rather. And every month, it used to be at the latest bar downstairs. Oh, yeah. Um, but now I'm not sure where they are now. And he has three speakers each week, and they're all weird subjects like what streams that run down under the houses in Brighton affect something, or why do poor voices, how many children do they normally have? I mean, really weird things that you go, what do I um, know about that about? But the that's speakers. That's a sophisticated QI by the sound well, of it. Well, it is a bit. But the, the speakers are normally so embedded and enthusiastic about what they're talking their about subject. that you learn something and it, they're great. That's it, that's it, because it's it's like a lot of things, like QI and all that, I love it, but then when, they, when the joke goes too far and they won't leave the joke alone, I know, they start yeah. shouting and say, well, I want to hear what Sandy's saying. Yes. I want to learn something from this. It's not just an entertainment yeah. show, although well, I love it. You learn from, these are great, these speeches, so mm. he invited me to go and do it one night. So oh, I no, took, so what was the subject? Oh, it was, well, me really. It was, it was just about toddography mm. and really about queer. And I took Miss Jason with me. 
I took, I think I took the mayor, I think it was Denise Cobb at Denise the time, Cobb. the mayor yeah. in her chains down in the cellar at the latest bar and a few odd sods around yeah. to support. And I sat through the first two speakers, they were so academic, so intellectual, and I'm sitting there thinking, God, they're going to hate me, because they're all like, the audience are all sort of 35 to 55 academics, yeah. and book readers and everything. But I'd taken with me a gold, um, almost like a jacket, a gold backpack, so I thought the only way to start this off is to go up to the lectern and go, I am theatrical and I've got a gold backpack to prove it. <laughs> and that so settled them. Settled it yes. down. They probably enjoyed you better. It went down really well. You invited me back. Yeah. I said, no, it's the latest now. Of course, the latest TV. Close mm. now. It's gone to New it's, it's Well, they haven't got a studio there either. All the stuff went yeah. over, they haven't got it done. And we had, who did we have? Mike Mendoza was on oh, our yeah. previous yeah. episode. Oh, I saw him, yeah. And he, um, he said, well, he just doesn't understand it. And of course, the lease was up yes. for where it was. And I think they were going to move the latest theatrical side of it to the pier. They have. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think is going to be, is it that pub at the end of the pier? Horatio. Horatio. Yes. yes. And, so they, they haven't really got a studio at the moment. So oh. how, how the hell they are transmitting is beyond me. And a lot of it is. And we said, how many times have we said that a lot of it is so many repeats of stuff they did 10 years ago. And of course, mm. their license is up this year. Is it? Mm. Um, I'm sure they're going to renew. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's, it's a resource there that we've always thought, well, why don't you, you're not utilising the resource of local television. Mm performance and all that to the best of its ability and a lot of the time a lot of this is a bit of an ego trip I'm sure you know and and all that all we're doing turn I remember doing one with Andrew Cape called Cook It which was a making burgers and the other guy who remained homeless came out from that's how you make television I said I wouldn't say that say that at the BBC no you know okay. put it come off yeah. your high horse muck yeah. the stable out you know yeah. all that. you're doing local community television, which is fabulous, mm -hmm. and it gives the opportunity to everyone, but, but they don't do it. people that are local, yeah. I mean, yeah, how much, in Bright, I mean, you've lived here, you know. I've lived here 25 years, yeah, I've been, 15 I've been of here, them in Hove. I've been here about 30 odd years. Mm. And the amount of talent there is in Brighton mm. and surrounding areas is astounding. But it's very hard to find it. Because equity, There's a lot of crap as well. Well, yes, <laughs> but equity won't, obviously because of data protection. Mm. If you go, I'm doing a play and I'd like to offer it to equity members first, could you give me a list of equity members in Brighton or East Sussex? Sorry. So you have to dig around. and which is Well, if there, if, there, if there are any... You see, what I don't understand, when I, I remember I was an agent in the past year, so, and when I loved it, I do miss, miss both of those things, because I want to say, actually, I'm pretty good at it as well, well thought of in the industry. But the fact is, I always, and I had to coerce a lot of people, because mm. um, it was easy to get into equity, it was harder to get on spot. Oh, yes. Yeah. And I said, you've got to be on, so that's your calling card. If you're not on Spotlight, you may as well go and stack shelves and test Exactly, shelves. yeah. I mean, you're on Spotlight, I'm on Spotlight. Yes. You know. I never get anything from it, but I'm there. People well, want to know. And th this year, because of my illness, I've been very lucky, because you know, I've not been very well, as you all lot know, don't you? Yes, you can send me around some nice chocolates and stuff like that. <laughs> um, and what happened was um, they do Spotlight do a bursary for oh, about thirty members. Yeah. Depend no no age restriction, and mm. depending on your circumstances and all that. I said, well, I won't get that. In all I've been the Spotlight crosses how many years, um, and I just put it in and I said, well, I've had this neuropathy and all this other rubbish and all that, and it's you know a bit hard. And it's a bit difficult now because. You know, I don't work as much as I do mm. ordinarily rather than just films and stuff. Mm. 
um, I got one. Oh, so, and it's a whole year, which works at about sixteen fifty a month. I remember, I can't remember much it is. I can't. I don't know. Um, well, you do yours all in one go. I do my monthly, but they they, they give you twelve months. Very good. Which is fabulous. So anyone out there who's aspiring to be an actor, if you're not in spotlight and it's difficult to get into, equity is much easier because they need the membership funds. Mm. But if you need to go into spotlight, that's your calling card. Without it, forget it. You may as well go on to these mandis and casting now things, which are not really professional sites. They are just set for people that can't can't get onto things like spotlight. Mm. Really, with spotlight, all you've got to do is have a few contracts. Mm. But with the equity thing, what would help people trying to book local people? Because yeah. I'm doing a play at Horatio's on May the 2nd, mm. 3rd and 4th, which is about Marilyn Monroe. Oh, lovely. Three-hander. Marilyn Monroe. Mm. And, yeah, and we've got an amazing actress coming down from London to do it. Not Laura Nixon, because she's... No, not she's, Laura. Laura, she's lovely. She was fabulous, yeah. yeah. No, this is a lady called Susie Kennedy, and yeah. she's... I tell you you'd think it was Marilyn and I had a read through at my house not so long ago and I went to pick her up at the station mm. and I, I had her come down an hour early to, so we could chat and everything and then I've got um, an actor and a what well, you have to call them actors now but a female actor and a male mm. actor uh, it's three-hander so they were coming a bit later and they came one by one and I said to Susie because she came with all the hair and the Beautiful makeup, and, mm. and she changed into the white strapless dress because mm. she's got all the, the outfits. Dresses and, I call it. Mm. Yeah. and so I said, "Will you go and open the door?" Because they, these other actors had never met Susie, so when they arrived, Marilyn Monroe opened the door to them. <laughs> Their faces were a picture because they weren't expecting to see what looked like real Marilyn Monroe. So, so that would be very good. But to find. The actors, local actors, was so difficult to get the source of how to find So the two actors are playing the other two parts of Brighton based, are they? One's Brighton and one's Little Hampton, I oh, think, it's not too which far, is the same kind of thing. Yeah. But it's really difficult to find that. And what when they do get their equity cards, what they don't do, and I'm not pushing the union or anything, but I'm mm. saying it's useful for them, every second Saturday there's an equity meeting, every second Saturday of a month, the there's a meeting at the Friends Meeting Friends House, 10.30, and there, I think, I'm making this up completely, but I think in the East Sussex area, there's probably about 20,000 members, mm. or five, or something. Anyway, it's a lot of people, and at that meeting we normally have about 12. And we have people from equity who come down as speakers and tell us all about the new rates of pay and what you can mm. do and what you can't do. Intimacy, intimacy directors who come and explain mm. all about that. And none of the young ones come. But if they came, once they've managed to get a card, come and learn mm. Mm. how it, you can be helped. You know, like you've just said about well, yeah. um, there's funds, benevolent funds. But there's actually benevolent fund. There's um, equity have a, 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 um, a social fund as well for actors who are yeah. on their uppers. Um, there's one or two other charities that you can go to. But um, the reason that I say we've well, got to become a member of equity anyway, and I said the one thing if you think about it. You get 10 million quid's worth of public liability yes, insurance you included, which if you were to pay for that separately, would probably be the cost of your, exactly. um, your, your membership, mm -hmm. you know, of yeah. equity. Yeah, right. But I, I've been a member of... I'm a long-term member now, which I'm sure you probably are as well. Well, it's, oh, it's, it's about 12.50 a month, because I'm on the lowest grade, because it's all done, equity's all it's done on... 70, 80 year, I think, the long It's term. all done on how much you earn in the year, That's so if you're over 50,000, it's like 3,000 quid. not a know. lot of actors that are going to be doing Only, only due to only due to them. Yes. She was at the rush. I think she would be... I think she's doing quite rate, well, I think she's yeah. doing quite well as our Judy. I um, think so, yeah. But uh, I... I do believe that. I'm glad that you believe in it too, because a lot of people think, oh, I'm going to be bothered. And I said, yeah. what happens if something happens to you? Mm. 
you know, even if it is a non-equity contract, they're still there to help yeah. you if you've got a problem. I can give you a good example. Some time back, I can't remember when it was, I was invited to do La Cenerentola at the Royal Opera House. Mm. And there was a German version of it, and they didn't like it because there was one scene meant to be Prince and Dandini, and it was meant to be a bit slapstick fast. Yeah. And so they had got me in because of my panto connections to do this one particular scene. So off I go and I do it. And it involved a candelabra, and it was a passing of the candelabra that made it funny or not. But we had no prop in the rehearsal room. So we're just trying to mime it and imagine what it would be like. So then we're in Maestro's, what I call band call, but, but music call, and we're waiting in stage left in the wings, and I see the prop. Ah, oh, there's the, chandel the candelabra. And I, it only involved the one male singer from the chorus, who was a leader of the chorus as a footman, and Dandini, who was an Australian guy, who I knew from when I did Mikado in Australia. So I said, oh guys, we've got the prop and you two, can we just practice that bit where we pass it to get the joke right? And the Australian went, yeah, sure, no problem. Mm -hmm. And the head of the chorus, 30 men in the chorus, the head of the chorus went, I'd love to, Carol. But the trouble is, on stage, they're playing the music from Act 2, Scene 5. And the scene with the candelabra is act two, scene one. And if we rehearse it when well, it's not the same scene as on stage, somebody will have to pay all 30 members of the chorus a full session because I've rehearsed it with one person. So it was never corrected and never worked and it was never funny. So that's fine, get over that yeah. one. Then I go away on some job and I'm coming back from Heathrow I get the tube and I get off at Covent Garden for some reason and there's a big poster, you know, up the side of the tube wall and it said Chenerentola. So I went in to see them and I said, who choreographed it this time? And they went, oh, hang on a minute, and, oh, Carol Todd did. I went, well, I'm Carol Todd and I've not been in here to rehearsals. So I went to see the producer, he said, oh, it's all been changed by it. Gave me a couple of tickets to go and see it and it was exactly as I left it with it not being funny. So I went to equity and they eventually got me 500 pounds. And that must have been, oh, I don't know, 15 years ago. And I'm really grateful for that. Absolutely. Really grateful. You see, it's an awful lot of these things. And I remember back in the day when I was an agent in the casting eight as an agent, because mm. I loved being an agent. I loved it if, saying, I remember our lovely Michael Darnell, God rest his soul. Oh, God, yeah. He often was appeared in Donut in Crime Stoppers, not as the villain, uh, but he'd play probably, uh, and uh, they would all often say, um, when he went to film for the BBC, that, um, oh, can you say this, that, and the other? So he would, should have been paid a speaking part. Mm, gotcha. So we waited until the uh, transmission, of course it comes up, straight to BBC Tons, and I'm saying to them, all right, right, can you pull this one out please, uh, out of your database? You've got him speaking in that, and you've only paid him the normal walk-on fee, and I want the full fee, and that should be, you know, because it was a couple of days, so I'm going to ask for a whole week. Mm. I got it. Did you? Well done. You know, because they try and put a fast one. Or we, the director said, we can get, get away with this, then no one will notice. But of course, and then one time... Somebody always noticed. Mike my, my, my was in casualty, and he's playing the, the ill person lying in bed, only because he wasn't ill, because the daughter had given him wacky back in, oh, in, right. in, okay. in herbal tea or something, mm. and you know, that's what would happen. So I went round there, a couple of bottles of wine, because it was in the old steam, went round there. We were watching it and saying, you know, I said, I love this bit at the end of the titles go up. This didn't have a title on the end of it. I hit the roof. I was straight on to them and I said, you've got to put this title on. He's not, he's, you know, one of the main people in it. What happened there? Mm. You know, um, he got about a hundred times conversation for that. Well, that's something. It's something, yeah. But, I mean, but you need the name because it's the name that people see and they go, "Oh, I do it when I'm casting mm. stuff." You know, I go, oh, "I've forgotten about them. They've yeah. been really good." Yeah, yeah. That, you don't see the name, you don't remember the yeah. person. 
Not intentional. Not intentional. Mm -hmm. We'll just hold on a minute. We'll be back with you in a second. And we're back again. Hello, Carol. Hello. Yeah. So we've just been talking CVs, you see, and uh, um, and memories of people because uh, we, over the years, we've lost quite a few people. We? Certainly have. Um, and mutual friends mm. and all that have passed away. And uh, you're just mentioning our lovely friend from the telly, Andrew Cave. Andrew Cave, good man. Who, who's a lovely guy. Mm. Um, I keep on getting a repeat on latest TV when we were oh, cooking burgers very good. in his Cook It programme, which we did 10 years ago. I went to Andrew's for Christmas this year with Carol Brennan and Simon, who reviews for GC or whatever oh, yeah, it's called, yeah. Sina. Um, and he cooked us a wonderful... Oh. We so did, much. didn't we? We did a Mark and Chums with Andrew K. Okay. It was it was the longest one we did. We might have to go back and be a show because of course he, he was the PA to Barry Humphreys and right, all yeah. sorts of things, you know. So he's a lovely guy, I've got a lot of time for him. But um, Yeah, he's just rewritten my bio from Yeah. Me. Well that's fantastic. Yes. You cut cut it down and so rather than, it's always good to get somebody else to do it because yes. you cut all the Oh, should I put that bit in? Should I put that bit in? And we also, when we write them ourselves, we kind of go, she has done boom, 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 boom. And also she has done boom, boom, boom. And they put it more interestingly, you know, like having returned from a trip to Australia, yeah. she found herself back in the north. Yeah, we've the barns, like these stuff, barns you know. that go in between programmes and yes. all that you look at it. It's just basically a list of what people have done. Yeah, but he, he did it really well. Oh, I well, know, he's a clever man, I tell mm. you. And a very good cook. Very good. We bought him a little, little package of bits, didn't we, just to say thank you to him. Um, oh, and he was thrilled with that because he is a bomb prefer. And yeah. what made me laugh was sitting there chatting away and he, you know, and he, he loves his food, but just leave it at that. And he didn't have a qualm about it at He said, Mark, this is my CV. Yes, yeah. Because he, you know, he's done cookery programs, he's done a lot, he really mm -hmm. is, and he's a charming, charming man. I've got a lot of time for him. I did a couple of shows, I did two of his chat shows for him as well. Mm -hmm. Of course, we also had some other friends one of which died too young um, and were married. That's, um, um, of course, Mark Lanahan, who's remarried since. Oh, yeah. And, of course, Claire, Claire who was a fabulous singer. Yeah, she was really good. Uh, and, unfortunately, she died of lung cancer. Yeah. Um, I remember she had, uh, at the time, I was putting musicals onto uh, piano ships mm. and we did three months rehearsal with the original ship and Claire had done the rehearsals. She and Mark got married a week mm. before. It was all wrong. They got married a week before the ship went off to Australia and no, she hadn't done the rehearsals. Some other woman had done the rehearsals mm. who decided that she didn't want to go away for nine months, I think it was. Mm. Which she was of an age and yeah. you know, she got more connections then. So Claire was brought in at the last minute and she just got married and was taken away from the marriage and was expected to learn like 14 shows all in one go and it just never really worked out. Bless her. She did, Such a she, shame, she, yeah. she, I was her agent, I was both her agents oh, right. for a long time. And of course, she, I remember she went back on the ships in her later before she, you know, a few years before she passed away. And unfortunately, she had to be recalled back to the UK. Well, this was the trip. Was that that trip? Because she she was unwell. Yeah, she was. Took, well, all the lungs and all that, and uh, she liked to teach her or two. And I yeah. think I think it just I think it just got to her. Well, it's it's not fun. Mm. Uh, it's very very hard work. Oh God, I would. I've had lots of friends do it. I did a, mm. I did um, a television pilot called Downstage. Oh, yeah. It was all about Andrew and Theatre Group doing um, Peter Pan 
with music like Fly Me to the Moon and all this sort of business in it. It was it, I wish it had gone to series because it was very good. And the young lad in that who played one of the actors in it, mm. um, uh, Vinny Plantain, his name was, he died at 32 from lung cancer. Oh, but he didn't even smoke. And I think a lot of the problems with people, it's you know, Roy Castle, mm. all the passive smoking. Absolutely, because yeah. everyone could smoke everywhere. I mean, Back we, in those days, it was... Well, we it, will it, remember being on the top of a bus. You mm -hmm. could smoke at the back on the top of a bus. Yeah. Which is unbelievable. You can tell she was very naughty on the top of the back of the bus. Yeah. Mine so was I. Mm, yeah. But I, I still occasionally have a cigarette, not as much as I used to. Mm. Uh, only because I don't really inhale it. In fact, it's 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 sort of like that. It's one of those you can always tell an actress or actor on television or film when they, they don't, don't smoke, smoke they and they've got to smoke. They hold it like really and they sort of hold it arms length and they sort of. I tell you something interesting from the at smoking point of view is. Uh, the last West End show I ever did was No No Nanette with Dame mm. Anna Neagle. Bless her. And that was no, not, no, no, no. Well, wasn't no, no. a pleasure. Mm? It wasn't a pleasure. What, because of her? Or? No, no, not her. I was swing dancer for 20 girls oh, and singers. Oh. So swing for both sing and dance. I was understudy to Anita Graham as one oh. of the three girls. And I was... Well, dance captain, I was everything. I also used to do three months on, three months off at the Stork Club afterwards, which was empty. It was just a hook up joint, really. Mm. Uh, but I had more money than anybody because I had all these act extra tags to my, my name and everything. And stage left, I said to you, well, it'll be different now because they'd be done it up. Mm. But stage left, you would have a big room when you came off the stage into this big room that had a massive mirror, which I think is still there with the, you know, the ornate frame around mm. it. And all round were shelves with ashtrays. And you would come off, you'd be doing I Want to Be Happy, which is a big tap routine, and mm. you'd go, ah, 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 and you'd grab a cigarette and go, oh, and that's You're never what, alone. Strand. Well, there you go. And so that's what we would do to get mm. our breath back. And it was accepted. And when you open the door, this stench of cigarettes would come on stage. It was terrible. But I, I, I've, never, I've never really minded. The, I mean, I remember, you know, um, the old days because, the, you know, the flavoured cigarettes like menthol, so you can't get them anymore because, oh, you know, and it's like this vaping thing, there's all these illegal vape things going on. The cigarettes are £15 a packet. Oh, I know how much, aren't I mean, they, Stephen? Stephen? What's that? £15 a packet, aren't they, Stephen? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, because I often, I often don't get in, a little present from them. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I, at the end of the day, you know, um, feel that your career is is extraordinary in the amount, as you said, of what you've been able to achieve and all those from actually doing the craft of do dancing and all that, and then going on to do all these, I mean, just pages and pages of it is, is, is fabulous. Yeah, you know how really I got the brain was I had done the net, I was very young, and I just gave up. Mm. I thought, I'm up to here with, you'd run around, you'd have five people off at least every day. Mm. And Drury Lane was tiny little dressing rooms. And again, it had all been booked because they looked like the American counterpart. Mm. So you'd go into, a, I would go in at half past four every day and I had my little portable record player. I'd do a warm up myself because those days you didn't have to warm the company up, you mm. just come in and do it. And then I would get the list of who was off. So I would sit upstairs. I was put in a dressing room with a lady, I think her name was Marion, but she lived in Ealing with her mum and cats. And she was a soprano. So when you're singing all the songs and that, everyone's tapping, but out of breath, she would stand in the wings, just facing and sing the soprano line was now they have a booth or they have kick tracks yeah. or whatever. But her voice, so that's all she did. And so I was in a room with her 
So there wasn't a lot for us to chat about, mm. quite different. So I would work out all the things about who had to do what. Then I had to go around all the rooms telling everybody, well, you do this, I'll do that. And they would go, yeah, all right. Because, mm. you know, they weren't invested in it. So I thought that's enough. So I went to Trends Management to get new work. And Dougie Squires, who God bless him. Indeed, who we lost last year. Um, it was only last year. Wasn't yeah, it? it was last year. Mm -hmm. uh, he created Young Generation, the second mm -hmm. generation. I went into the office. Jamie Phillips ran it, lovely man who's also passed. And by CV, he had all these wonderful things on it, like assistant, dance captain, understudy, dum dum dum. So Dougie was the peak of his career then, mm. and he had junior showtime at Yorkshire Television. He physically couldn't do it. So he said, I'll take two associates up and they can do the work. So he said, he chose me, who he'd never met, but only by my CV, and a friend who's like my best friend for life, Roger Hanna, who lives mm. up in Liverpool now. The two of us were sent up to Leeds. I met Dougie the night before for a meal, never met him in my life, mm. and then we were taken into the studio and you've got all the children, you've got all the mothers, you've got Jess Yates, you've got, Gosh. yeah, and then you've got Roger, who's, you know, done a number. Mm. And they went, well, look, let's Roger do his number so Dougie can see it, and Jess Yates, and Roger Cheveley, the director, can see it. And then, in the meantime, here's some music. You can have a look at the music and do your number next, make one up. And it was a clapping song, which is quite difficult, because it goes, clap, 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 clap. Clap, 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 clap. So I don't read music, so I'm hearing someone else's music, all these kids dancing. I'm looking at this sheet of music, I thought, I just want the earth to swallow me up. And so they went, your turn now. And I went, oh, okay. And Dougie came up and stood by my ear, and he went, why don't you start with a little Chinese girl and do it as a you know, three shot, then crane out, and then cut over the other side. I went, oh, yeah, fine. Okay, what we'll do, we'll start with blah, blah. And the director, it turned out, he knew nothing about choreography either. So you've got a director who knew nothing about dance, or what, terrible, because in those days, the camera was part of the dancing, because you yeah. choreograph to the cameras. Yeah. So you knew what the next shot it was going to be and it would be on the script before yeah. you even did anything whereas it's a bit more freestyle now and so we got through it it was the best number that was ever on that series because Dougie had done it really. I remember it and I stayed then with Trends Management for five years as Dougie's assistant and there was a lovely lady called Tony Nelson who did casting there she was the best friend of Derek Dean who is London Festival Ballet or London English Ballet, who I bumped into the other week out of the blue and reconnected with. And so I would go everywhere with Dougie to the studios, to the theatre, learn lighting, learn cameras, learn everything. And then now and again there'd be a job that he couldn't do and it would be given to me. So slowly, slowly, and I did up. casting as well for three years in the mm. office then. Mm. Slowly, slowly, I took over my own work, came in. So I owe Dougie an awful lot. Yeah, work. and a lot of people do because they kind do indeed. Man. Yeah. Kind man. As was Bill Kenwright, of course. Oh, Bill. Well, I worked for Bill for 25 years on and off. Yeah. And he'd always find me something to do. He put me, he got me into. Um, Sean Mathias's season at Windsor, mm. uh, I think it was two years ago, with Sir Ian McKellen. Yeah. And the first one I did, I think, was Hamlet. And it was just to do a tiny bit of waltzing. Mm. And then the next one was Cherry Orchard. And I had to do them bursting in from the back of the theatre. It was all filmed in the theatre. Mm. Had them bursting in with a little bit of country dance. And I don't know really anything about period dance or country dancing, but Sean Mathias likes you to be, to respond to what 
he needs okay. without it being text, but we have to do that. We have to get the essence of it and the feel of it. Yeah. And and I can remember it was summer, it was hot, and we were rehearsing in an empty top shop in Windsor, because it's a big space, you know. Yeah, that's the best way to do it, isn't it? They all closed down <laughs> with COVID. And so Ian was sitting on the pavement outside having his sandwich for lunch in the sunshine. And as I left, because I'd done my bit, he said, um, Excuse me, did you do that dancing bit? I went, yes, I did. He went, it's ever so good, well done. I and I it. went home floating on a cloud. And I did Frank and Percy for them, yeah. um, that was in the other palace for a while, yeah. um, with, with Roger Allen, it was a two handed, so Ian and Roger Allen. So I bet they were little highlights. Of so that was your bit. Do I was going to say Dorothy Squires, or Doug, well, Dougie, <laughs> Dougie yeah. Squires, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah then a, a nice comment there, we can. So, we're coming to the end of our, our show oh, today. Which I know we, can, we could go on. Well, what's for the future? What have we got coming up now? Well, on Sunday, I go to Windsor for Jenny Seagrove, who is Bill's, well, Bill's partner. Yeah. Mm. And it's about the sixth year I've done it, I do a, a big charity. The main chance, which is a, a horse sanctuary that Jenny, Jenny looks after, um, it's comics night, so we have a load of comedians, and I organise all of that for that. And then, then I've got the play, beginning of May. That starts rehearsing mm. in about a week or so. Um, and then I'm doing Adam's family for the outreach. It's for it's half children with some right. adults, you know. I've done Bugsy Malone, Cats, Legally Blonde, Oliver. I mean, you do travel a lot, don't you? I do, yeah. Yes, you're sure. always oh, you saw Mark, I'm, I'm on a train, and I'm, yeah. sure I'm in the middle of, I'm, I'm, there. I'm, I'm just about to get on the underground and yeah. all that. So well, that's it, and then it's Panto. But well, what Panto are you doing this year? I can't say it though. We're not allowed to say it because no. we're currently in March. Well, nearly my... April. But watch this space. Yes, I can't say because it's quite interesting, but I don't think I don't want to jinx it. Jinx it, no. right? Well, Carol, I've had the most, and I've, I'm so proud to know you as a friend. Oh, we, bless we, you. We, we've been mates for a long time. We, haven't we don't often bump in together, no. do we? When I was working at Morrison's Rector, we had that lovely evening out. Do you remember? Do you remember that? Was that? When we went down to that other guy's place and drank all his gin. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's a while back now. Oh well, it's, it's all closed down now. It's a bit, Has it? Yes, so they, they ran off owing all the stuff. They owed me about three grand. Did they really? Yeah. Yeah. So that's another story for another time. So Carol Todd, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Mark. And I think it's now time for pudding. Oh.